Judge Alexander de Moraes has blocked X, formerly known as Twitter, in Brazil, where an estimated 40 million people access the site each month. Circumventing the ban with a VPN could get you fined about 9,000 US dollars a day, which is around the a- average annual income per capita in Brazil. It happened after X's owner, Elon Musk, reinstated accounts that the Brazilian state has accused of being part of digital militias, undermining Brazil's democracy. Musk has accused the judge of repeatedly and brazenly betraying Brazil's constitution, called for his impeachment, and described him as Brazil's Darth Vader. The judge has accused Musk of criminal instrumentalization of the X platform and frozen the assets of Musk's satellite internet company Starlink in the country. Joining us today from Brazil to talk about all this and the intensifying global crackdown on online speech is Glenn Greenwald. He's a man who needs no introduction to our audience, so I'll just say that you can see his show System Update every weeknight at 7 p.m. Eastern on Rumble and see an archive of all his latest work on his Substack. Glenn, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Great to be with you guys. So I thought that uh, in order to better understand why this judge has picked a fight with X and Elon Musk, or maybe it's the other (laughs) way around, uh, it'd be helpful... (laughs) for you to give your take on the tumultuous political events in Brazil that have led to this moment, starting with Jair Bolsonaro losing the presidential election by a fairly narrow margin to Lula da Silva. Uh, we've cut together a little montage that features a couple of sound bites from Bolsonaro. These sound bites, uh, as we do on this show, because we have audio listeners, have been translated uh, and dubbed using AI from uh, Portuguese into mm-hmm. to English. Uh, but there's some sound bites of Bolsonaro sowing doubts about Brazil's election integrity in the lead up to the vote. Uh, and then some footage from January when his supporters breached <laughs> several government buildings, the Capitol, the Supreme Court, Presidential Palace, claiming that the election was fraudulent. So let's roll that to get into this conversation. Our electoral system is unauditable. It is not possible to prove whether or not there was fraud in the elections. This system here makes it impossible to establish any relationship or correlation between the voter and their vote. There's the uh, storming of the building, big crowd gathering outside. some overturned tables. Uh, so obviously Americans will be inclined to draw some parallels to our own situation in 2020 in our, in, in our minds, but just taking Brazil on its own terms, how do we get from the events of 2022 to an outright ban of a huge platform like X? Yeah, so I think the setup uh, explicated very well the key point, which is in many ways what's happening in Brazil is simply a reflection of broader trends, both in the West and Western Europe, but also in Canada and the United States, the UK. This sense that I think emerged primarily after 2016, that Western elites can no longer permit a free internet, because when you allow a free internet, their media outlets cannot monopolize discourse any longer. The propaganda system becomes weakened. I think they were particularly traumatized by the dual events of the UK voting to leave the EU through the ratification of Brexit, followed only three months later by the greatest trauma of the, of the lives of, of the Western liberal, which is the defeat of, of Hillary Clinton by Donald Trump. And you can really see immediately following that the emergence of this uh, new industry called anti-disinformation funded by all sorts of Western liberal billionaires, the same small handful that fund sort of that. Uh, projects to censor the internet in the name of uh, Russian influence as well. And so this whole industry popped up based on this idea that we can no longer allow an internet to be free because when we do, we get these forces that are directly threatening to the establishment. So if you bring me in Brazil, just go back a little bit from where you began, which was in 2018 when Jair Jair, Jair Bolsonaro decided to run uh, for president. Nobody took Jair Bolsonaro seriously. He was sort of like, I don't know, the Matt Gage, the Marjorie Taylor Greene 
of Brazilian politics. He had been a member of Congress for 30 years. He drew a lot of media attention through these outlandish statements that were often very anti-democratic, but he was very good, very charismatic at bringing a lot of attention to himself, but he was always on the fringes of political life. The anti-establishment, anti-status quo sentiment in Brazil grew so much that he was able to channel that by presenting himself as the enemy of the establishment, very similar to Trump did, that a lot of Western European populist parties are doing. And out of nowhere, kind of became president of, of Brazil. He, he won by a, a fairly large margin over the Workers' Party, which had been Lula de Silva's party that had pretty much dominated Brazilian politics and ruled Brazil since 2002. And so a lot of what was ha- what started happening in Brazil in terms of free speech, just like in the United States and, and Western Europe, was a reaction to a very aggressively anti-establishment movement that had a right-wing populist strain to it, a pretty dominant right-wing populist strain. And they were petrified of it because it was absolutely a threat to status quo establishment ruling power. And I was somebody who thought Jair Bolsonaro was incredibly dangerous to Brazilian democracy. I was saying that all the way up until the election. But after the election, it was very clear that Brazilian institutions were a lot stronger than people thought were able to make Jair Bolsonaro a very weak candidate, just like I think American institutions made Trump a very weak candidate, really limited what he was able to do versus what he was, the sort of stuff he was saying. And very quickly into Bolsonaro's administration, they created through the Supreme Court a criminal investigation called Criminal Investigation into Fake News. And it empowered this one single judge, Alexandre de Moraes, who is not a leftist. In fact, he was appointed by this center-right president who preceded Bolsonaro, who became president when they impeached uh, Dilma Rousseff, who was the left-wing uh, part of Lula's presidency. And the entire Brazilian left thought that this was a coup. They thought that Alexandre de Moraes was this fascist. They called him a fascist, a racist, uh, a white nationalist. I mean, all the things that the left calls people when they dislike him. So he was very much not a man of the left. But he was kind of a sort of Mitch McConnell figure, very center right or right wing, but very pro establishment. And he was very powerful. He was connected to a lot. He was a lawyer. He used to defend a lot of very powerful criminal gangs and the like, very well connected to police and the armed uh, agencies. And they empowered him to essentially start single handedly policing the internet to just order uh, people banned from the internet, hosts uh, removed from the internet with a very powerful fine structure and punishment structure for big tech if they failed to do so very quickly within two hours of the order being issued. And it became this censorship mania, as you probably know very well, that when human beings get the censorship power, it's very intoxicating, it's very inebriating, it's incredible power. And they were able to start building this idea that the only thing that could save Brazilian democracy was censorship. And it just kept growing and growing and growing over the years al Shadow de Moraes was transformed into the most admired national hero by the Brazilian left that was just four years earlier calling him a fascist and a racist and all of that because he was imprisoning, not only uh, censoring, but then began imprisoning their political enemies with no due process, just through a stroke of a pen, became the most powerful judge, I think, of any country in the democratic world anywhere. And so with all that adoration and all that encouragement, his power grew. He had to give a very authoritarian mindset. And he started issuing so many censorship orders that, for example, Rumble, the platform where I had my show on, um, decided that they could no longer be in Brazil just because they couldn't and wouldn't comply with the avalanche of censorship order. I'm talking about they would censor and order removed from the internet elected members of Congress, some of the people with the highest vote total. So in the name of democracy, they were kicking off the internet through a stroke of a uh, judge's pen, no trial, no due process, nothing. You know, people who got the biggest votes among the Brazilian people to represent them in the Congress. And so Rumble is already out of Brazil. If I want to watch my own show when I'm in Brazil or we have to transmit it on Rumble, we have to use a VPN because there's no way to access Rumble in Brazil because of this. And so Elon got to that same point where, you know, X every day was being ordered to censor hundreds and then thousands, not just again of random citizens, you know, spreading hate speech anonymously, but prominent elected members of, of, of the Brazilian Congress and others. And Elon got to the point where he said, we're not going to comply with this unjust, coercive censorship scheme that itself is illegal. And it is for reasons that I could explain, but it, it has no legal basis. And so this judge said, either when, 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 when X 
started not complying with the, these, some of these orders, they threatened to arrest the executives of X physically present in Brazil. So protect, to protect X employees, Elon closed X's offices in Brazil so there were no more people they could imprison. And then also continued to allow those posts and people to, to remain on social media. And so Alshon Denim and I said, either within 48 hours, you remove every post I've ordered taken down and you appoint a Brazilian representative on Brazilian soil to represent X. Like who in their right mind would do that except somebody already serving a life sentence of prison, given the threats to imprison him, or we're going to ban X from, from Brazil. And when Elon didn't comply, they, this judge issued not only an order banning X from all of Brazil, and it's now completely unavailable and inaccessible in Brazil unless you use a VPN. He also invented a law. How, how does a judge invent a law that says it is now illegal to use a VPN to access X and anyone who does pays the fine that you reference, which is an exorbitant fine from any perspective, $10,000 a day, but from a Brazilian perspective, they're like, there's 1% of the population that could pay that for, for even a single day. And it just shows how extreme I think Brazilian culture is in terms of its abandonment of any belief in free speech. But I think also you see a lot of support for it in the broader West, which may not have gone as far yet as Brazil has gone, but is very much on that same path. I think all three of us agree that Mauritius' action was horrifying, right? Like this sets a terrible precedent. But Glenn, I'm curious about whether you could walk us through what implications this has for separation of powers in Brazil and for rule of law. This strikes me as a huge possible turning point. Well, it's it's interesting because when Bra Brazil redemocratized in 1985 and then enacted its constitution in 1989, they wrote this constitution that actually is more robust in its protections than the American constitution on which it in part was modeled. So it's a very... Uh, extensive constitution, but it's very much based on the idea of separation of powers, a balance of power between three branches, the congressional, the judicial, and the, the executive. And the Supreme Court had always been sort of the most, the, the weakest, the most obscure of the three branches. They just kind of issued technical rulings about the law. But then once the emergence of Bolsonaro happened, all the rules went out the window, similar to how in the United States, every media outlet changed their ethos, every institution changed how they began functioning with the single-minded goal of, of stopping Trump. The idea became that, look, we have to amass every power we can amass to destroy the Bolsonaro movement, to imprison these, the leaders, to prevent it from succeeding. And the Supreme Court started to become the most dominant force in the country by far. They often just legislate overtly from the bench, like, should marijuana be illegal? Should it be illegal? At what point should abortion should be allowed? Should it be criminalized? They, they, they constantly issue laws that the Congress is starting to get very angry about it in terms of the invasion of their authority. The problem is, and it's very hard to explain Brazil to people, but Brazil is a very transactional country politically. The dominant the force in Congress are neither left or right. They're these kind of transactional centrists. And as long as their wheels are being greased, they will side with whoever is in power. And so Marais and the Supreme Court have done a good job neutralizing the Congress. So you have angry people in Congress, but that don't form a majority. There's a drive to impeach Marais because he's so such a tyrant and exceeding all bounds. But uh, they can't get a majority because the majority of people in Congress are getting what they really want, which are these transactional benefits. They're very much financially driven parties. They'll align with anybody, right or left, whoever benefits their immediate interests. So um, there's no safeguard on Marais's power. Like there's no means of reining it in at this point. I'll, I'll just give you a quick example. Um, about a month and a half ago, we obtained a massive archive of documents from the highest level of Marais's chambers, his the the WhatsApp conversations of his aides, audios, documents, and I was able to get this. And they partnered with the largest newspaper in Brazil, which is Folio of São Paulo, where I'm a columnist. I worked with them before. It's kind of like the New York Times of Brazil, just the biggest, most mainstream media outlet, and. Obviously, when you go around publishing people's private secrets in a way that makes them look bad, as our reporting was doing, they get pretty angry. I've seen that before in my reporting. <laughs> and never, though, have I seen before the opening by the judge who's the subject of the reporting, a criminal investigation that not only named the people they suspect having leaked this information, but also me, the, the reporters with my work, and Folia itself as part of this broad, endless fake news investigation and there were rumors that 
the police were going to come to our house, do searches and seizures to find out who our sources are, even though there's constitutional protection to guarantee sources. So I, none of that has happened yet, although there have been some formal steps taken to make it possible. But I know for sure that if it happened, the number of people willing to raise their voice in objection would be nowhere near sufficient to, to make it stop. There are no limits on his power. None. Zero. Wow. And it's because he's neutralized the center and become a hero to the left. And so the only people who protest him are Bolsonaristas, people who support Bolsonaro or otherwise from the right. right. And so it's made it as though the only way you can defend free speech in Brazil, the only way you can criticize the excesses of Adesh de Madaish is if you basically declare yourself to be some far right, in the words of a Brazilian mainstream society, a fascist. I'll add one other thing. I know a lot of lawyers, a lot of judges, a lot of people who work in Brazilian the legal system for a lot of different reasons. I've been reporting here. I've been living here a long time. My husband was a member of Congress. There are so many of them who will tell you that the majority of people in that world of, of legalism, law professors, judiciary, are petrified of how far he's gone. But when you try and get them to go on the record, you won't get any of them on the record because people are no. petrified of, of this judge. And that, to me, is the hallmark of the fact that you're living in a tyranny, that people are afraid to criticize a person who exercises political and public power. And that's very much the pervasive sentiment here. I'm Good. curious how you, like, where do you fit in here? Because, you know, you... We're facing this same situation under Bolsonaro. I mean, you uh, had obtained messages that showed that a judge was engaged in corruption in the Lula case, the, the case that ended up sending the current president, uh, then the former president, to prison. And that upset the Bolsonaro administration and you became a, a target of them. And now you're finding yourself in a similar situation with the opposite side of the political spectrum. It seems like you're kind of in a, a no man's land. Like how, how much longer are you uh, sticking around in Brazil, Glenn? Uh, well, yeah, I have a lot of new friends who were once my enemies very right. recently and a lot of new enemies who had been heaping me with the greatest praise just a few years ago. Because the reporting we did in 2019 and 2020 is what enabled when Bolsonaro ran for office in 2018, people assumed that his primary opponent was going to be Lula. And that was the big obstacle. Yeah. But this corruption force ended up convicting Lula and he went to prison. And our reporting was able to show that the judge sent him to prison. The prosecutors had been engaging in all sorts of corruption. They had been conspiring against him in secret. And it forced the Supreme Court to nullify Lula's conviction. It's what let Lula out of prison. Mm -hmm. And he had been sent to 11 year term. And then that enabled him to run for president against Bolsonaro in 2022, probably the only person who had any chance of beating Bolsonaro, and he won by a small margin. So at the time, I was public enemy number one of the Bolsonaro movement. I mean, they criminally indicted me. I, the judge ended yeah. up throwing it out for a, 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 a kind of coincidental reason. But also my husband was a very prominent member in Congress of the left wing party. So we And we were a gay couple in a country that has still difficulty with that. So um, it, you know, there a lot of threats came from the Bolsonaristas, but on the other hand, the, the Brazilian left could not have loved us more. And now it was sort of the all it took for that to reverse was for me to start in the beginning saying these the censorship is going way too far. Values of free speech matter to any democracy, and mm. because the people being censored were almost entirely on the right, it immediately alienated the left. Started having not just myself, but my husband looked at it as this sort of enemy, this traitor to their cause. And it also started making the Bolsonaros sort of having this strange new respect. And then that led to a lot of other critiques of, of Marais that I was willing to kind of take the lead in voicing using my yeah. protections that I have and my platform. And obviously the reporting that we did has, you know, unleashed that completely. But no, I don't, I mean, my kids are Brazilian. You know, they were born in Brazil. They lived their whole life in Brazil. They're 15 and 16. Um, I have no intention of leaving, um, but there definitely are threats and risks. But I think that's true of any journalist doing the right job of journalism. No. I, I would like to get you to weigh in on the legal question here. I've pulled um, a little bit of uh, Mauritius's order, which I translated just using Google Translate. We link this. We link all our materials in the description. So if anyone wants to get to the original material, it's there. 
But uh, essentially, this page, uh, Moraish says, social media is not a lawless land. Providers of social networks and private messaging services must absolutely respect the federal constitution, the law, and the jurisdiction of Brazil. Criminal instrumentalization of social media providers and private messaging services for the broadcast practice for the broadest practice of criminal activities on social media, including attacks on the regime could constitute civil and criminal participation in the conduct investigated. Then in this other section over here, he's specifically naming Elon Musk um, and say, accusing him of intentional criminal instrumentalization, uh, saying X shall refrain from disobeying any of the court orders already issued, uh, including reactivating profiles who we said need to be de deactivated under penalty of a daily fine of uh, 100,000 uh, Brazilian reals. Um, what's your reaction to the legal rationale the judge is laying out here, specifically his decision to single out Elon Musk as someone who's criminally instrumentalizing his platform to uh, threaten Brazilian democracy? So I, I think in theory, we could all agree that a country has the right to sovereign country to establish laws and then say that if you are a foreign corporation wanting to do business in our country, you have to comply with our laws. And if you don't, you can't do business here. Like in theory, that's a perfectly reasonable, I would even say universal view of every sovereign government, probably a hallmark of sovereignty is the ability to do that. Hmm. The, pro the problem becomes what if the uh, actions of the state that they're ordering are extremely unjust. For example, if the Chinese make a certain religion illegal, do will people say, oh, I think anyone who's expressing those religious views that have been made illegal by the Chinese government should be banned from all social media on the grounds that we have to abide by the dictates of Chinese law? What if a politician in the United States or a judge says anybody praising Donald Trump shall be immediately removed from the internet, even though that may have the pretext of legal authority do any does anyone actually believe that that's something that we would want a a big tech company to do so there's always this notion that things that the state orders can have a legal basis but they can also be abusive and illegal and that's the case here there's and, and again i mean it sort of takes a kind of a little bit of a technical knowledge that might be a, a little bit boring for me to really explicate but judges don't have this power to just order people banned to have been accused of nothing. And this is the thing is we got our whole, we got our hands on, on, on a secret order. I think it was the first one that we ever were able to publish from Moraes back in early 2023, where he ordered ban from every platform. He sent it to Facebook, Google, uh, then Twitter, Rumble, Telegram, uh, everyone. And he had a list of people. He said, these people are hereby banned. And among those people were elected senators, elect members of the Congress, the most popular podcaster in Brazil is sort of the Joe Rogan of Brazil, just banished from the internet. When we got this order and we contacted the people who were ordered banned, none of them had knew. None of them were advised no. of this order, let alone in, in the order itself, no explanation was given as far as what it is that they were alleged to have done wrong that justified the banning. Obviously, there was no process that was permitted for them to go in and, con and, and contest the justifiability of the rulings. These are acts of pure tyranny in their most extreme form. And that's why Rumble got to the point and they said, it's no, even though Brazil is a gigantic country, the fifth most populous country on the planet, very, very online country, a lot of young people, Rumble said, it's not worth this anymore for whatever benefits we can get Brazil because we don't want to be complying with this constant unjust censorship scheme. And that was the point that Elon Musk reached as well. It'd be one thing if the Congress enacted some sort of broad-based social media law that said, Anything that we determine to be hate speech or that we determine to be mis disinformation, the platforms have an obligation to remove it if they don't hear the penalties. The Congress tried to introduce a law like that, and it failed. They couldn't get a majority of uh, you know. votes. And in fact, one of the few times the establishment turned against Marais was when that law was pending and it looked like it might pass. Facebook and Google began lobbying against the law. They began using their platforms. Like if you were in Brazil and you access Facebook or any Google platform, there'd be a, a kind of box that said, call your member of Congress and urge them to vote no on this law because it'll restrict your free speech. And when Alexandre de Marais, again, just a single judge on the Supreme Court, 
saw that Facebook and Google was doing that, he ordered the federal police, the Brazilian equivalent of the FBI, to summon the executives of Google and Facebook to the headquarters of the federal police to be questioned and made them part of this criminal inquiry. The same thing happened when the the way that, as I said before, when we started doing our reporting, it was immediately, we were immediately included in this criminal fake news investigation because the mindset of this judge, like so many leaders around the world, is that any criticism of this judge, any suggestion or argument that he's exercising power illegitimately or, or tyrannically is not just misguided or unfair or wrong. It is an attack on the legitimacy of Brazilian institutions and therefore intended to weaken, if not overturn, Brazilian democracy itself. That's how we anyway. characterize the reporting that we began doing, which was this is fake news that is designed to weaken the legitimacy of Brazilian institutions and therefore overturn Brazilian democracy itself, which is a crime. If you if you try and do those things, that's how he characterizes anything that's critical of him. So you're, you're faced with real tyranny, like real authoritarianism. And again, in theory, I think companies should probably comply with duly enacted laws of countries. But when it becomes a, a an abuse of power, not an expression of legitimate power, I think they're more they're acting more ethically when they refuse to comply. Hope you enjoyed that clip from Just Asking Questions. You can watch another one here or the full episode there. We have an audio version of the podcast, which you can subscribe to using the link in the description and subscribe to Reason TV for notifications when these episodes go up every Thursday. Hope to see you then.